So I'm going to pass over now to, um, to uh, Jane Green from the NHS Confederation. Um, uh, Vanessa Young wants to have been with us, but regrettably she can't make it. So Jane is going to present to us. Can I invite Jane to... Oh, here we are. Jane um, actually has spent a lot of her life outside Wales in New Zealand, and uh, now he's back home. Um, so uh, I know that you've spent a lot of the recent uh, years also developing this relationship, this partnership, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Trevor. That's very good. Thank you. Jane Green. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jane Green. Um, Vanessa sends her sincere apologies, as uh, Trevor has already outlined, uh, not being able to spend uh, time with you today. Um, so I'm the um, step into the breach person. So be bear with me as I provide her presentation to you. Um, one of the things I think is really important that Trevor mentioned earlier on um, is the fact about the fiscal situation and with the autumn statement yesterday, we'll be making some comment on that. And equally, the, the whole concept of prudent health care and how vital it is, not only for prudent health care, but actually for everybody's well-being. So, as we all know, 2016 has been an eventful year. We have had tragedy with the loss of some of the world's greatest talents. We've had triumph with sporting success in both the Olympics and the Paralympics. And the world of politics, both here and in the United States, has all the markings of the Shakespearean play. Placing a focus on Wales, 2016 has also seen dramatic events <coughs> around the Assembly election, the EU referendum, and of course the success of the Wales football team in the Euros. For the NHS in Wales, this year it's been another busy one. Uh, during 2016, the Health Service in Wales is estimated to have conducted 18 million patient contacts in local primary care services, 500,000 ambulance 999 calls, 1 million emergency attendances, 400,000 emergency admissions, and 4 million outpatient attendances. The last 12 months have seen the publication of a report from the OECD, which concludes, despite many of the inflammatory headlines in the run-up to the 2015 general election, that the NHS in Wales is no worse than the rest of the UK. Quality is at the heart of the Welsh NHS, and patient-centred care is a major priority. We also have a new Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health, Wellbeing and Sport, who of course previously was the Deputy Health Minister, so is very well aware of the issues facing health and care and has a strong focus, focus on performance and remains committed to prudent health care agenda. This is very welcome, the principles of prudent health care, which actually Trevor alluded to earlier, making patients and the public equal partners in care caring for those with the greatest need first, <coughs> doing only what is needed and reducing inappropriate variation are vital to the NHS being sustainable in the future. But even with the adoption of these principles, the benefit may take time to see. The scale of delivering these activities in a period where resources, and it's not just finance, remains extremely tight, continues to pose many challenges for the health service. In the run-up to May's National Assembly election, the Welsh NHS Confederation published a briefing which outlined the key challenges uh, for our members both now and in the future. These are workforce, integration, need or demand, public health and finance. We continue to face significant problems when it comes to recruitment and retention of the workforce. We are already struggling with an unmet demand with concerning predictions that the level of reliance for health services will dramatically rise in the future. Meanwhile, our record of unhealthy behaviours, such as smoking, drinking and levels of obesity, is worse than any of the other UK countries, with around one in five adults smoking, four in ten drinking above the guidelines, and nearly six in ten being classified as overweight or obese. The impacts of this on the health service are huge. Smoking costs £386 million to the NHS every year. Physical inactivity costs £51 million. And the combined social and economic costs of alcohol and substance misuse in Wales is estimated to be around £2 billion. Of course, it's not just the NHS that faces these challenges. Most of them, if not all, can easily be applied across the public sector. And I think finance in particular will strike a chord with all organisations. 
The Chancellor, Philip Hammond, yesterday, in his autumn statement, made a stark revelation that government finances are expected to be £122 billion worse off for the period until 2021 than was forecast in March's budget. Here in Wales, the Welsh Government's draft budget shows health taking around 50% of the total Welsh resource DEL from 1718, resulting in a cash uplift of 4.4%. NHS <coughs> leaders are acutely aware of the additional funding for the NHS means less funding for other public services, many of which have an important contribution to supporting the health and well-being of our population. The recent Institute of Fiscal Studies report, Welsh Budgetary Trade-offs in 2020, 2019 to 2020, present a number of possible scenarios, all of which involve very difficult choices for politicians, public leaders and the public in the years ahead. In isolation, the 1718 uh, Settlement for Health is certainly better than expected and it, uh, better than anticipated in October's Health Foundation report, Pathway to Sustainability, which assumed an average of 0.7% in real terms up to 2019-20. But it needs to be considered in the wider context of the current level of unmet demand and the impact of ageing population with an increasing complex health needs, with significant increase in volumes of services that need to be provided using an aged physical and technological infrastructure that is not configured nor resourced for the demands of today. <laughs> to those outside the NHS, it might sound as if we're whining, but in fact, there was, as a country, the UK spends a smaller proportion of its GDP on health than other countries such as US, Canada, Portugal, France, Spain, and the Netherlands. And for what we spend, the value ex we extract is extremely high. The Health Foundation report argues that in the long term, that is in 2031, the NHS in Wales is sustainable so long as funding increases in line with GDP year on year, assuming an average of 2.2% in real terms, that the NHS continues to make efficiency savings at at least 1% per year, and the level and range of services stays the same. There are some significant risks in these assumptions. Medical, pharmaceutical and technological advances will alone add significant financial pressures year on year, which I'm sure you're well aware of. And there are other factors that influence this as well. I started by commenting on the um, highlights that happened in 2016, and two of the most notable are the UK referendum and then the subsequent change of Prime Minister. Both these events are set to influence the pressures faced by the health service, and with yesterday's autumn statement missing the golden opportunity to ease the strain on the NHS, a decision labelled by the NHS, sorry, but labelled by the Health Foundation is deeply disappointing, and I think you will have noticed many other comments that were made over the last 24 hours with regard to lack of funding for health and, in particular, social care. While we are, oops, one too far, sorry. While we are yet to see the impact of Brexit on the UK NHS as a whole, there are significant consequences which need to be considered. While the number of UK, EU nationals employed across the whole of the NHS workforce is, is relatively small, it is vital to remember that staffing numbers in the service operate on a very fine margin. So any decrease in staffing numbers will exacerbate the problem, and one of the solutions to the current staffing problem um, since September 2015 has been actually to recruit from the EU. Other implications include things such as um, research and innovation. We need to ensure that the NHS organisations can continue to participate in EU collaborative programmes and are allowed to lead and be a member of the European Reference Network post-Brexit. Again, another area of health technology regulation. We need NHS patients to be able to benefit from early access to the wide range of innovative health technologies available to the EU market and to ensure they don't miss out on opportunities offered to participate in EU clinical trials. And again, public health, employment law and cross-border healthcare remain areas of concern. In publishing its report on the NHS efficiencies, the Health Foundation suggested that some of the funding gap could be met through a com combination of increased efficiency savings and pay restraint. It is also stressed, it also stressed that the interdependence between health and social care and the need for sustained investment in the latter reaching, reaches the same conclusions as the CQC's recent State of Care report. Our members share this concern, and while ca social care budgets in Wales have not been hit as hard as in England, we are beginning to feel the impact 
of these pressures on adult services. And we were pleased to see in the draft budget that, is, that social care has been protected and had received protective funding in Wales for 1718. The challenge for our members, however, is to maximise efficiency across the whole of the system in Wales to ensure we're getting best value and that we're achieving best outcomes for our investment. It is important to note that we are, we are working hard and having some success in driving technical efficiencies. <coughs> Since 2011, the NHS in Wales has made savings over £800 million, not least through the establishment of a national shared support service and particular focus on extracting more value from procurement. As elsewhere, each year it gets harder and harder to find efficiencies, and even with the help of the latest settlement, the demand and cost pressures already in the system make savings very challenging. A Public Policy Institute for Wales report, Efficiencies and the NHS Funding Gap, identifies further opportunities that the NHS will have to pursue in order to actually find that it's working in a sustained and systematic way, which includes making better use of digital technology. If we are to deliver savings, we need to consider these facts within the next period. But we do have opportunities in Wales that might not present elsewhere. As a country, we have the advantage of size and governance arrangements in place to enable public sector leaders and politicians to work together on the whole system of health and care in Wales. The last two years alone have seen the introduction of a number of groundbreaking pieces of legislation, including the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014 and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act 2015. This legislation recognises the fundamental interdependence between health and other public services and particularly social care. So as we reach the end of 2016, what lies ahead? We've got the parliamentary review into the long-term future of health and care in Wales, which will be key to bringing everybody together to consider the issues that I've already outlined. We very much welcome this collaborative approach and will be doing all we can to support it. We are continuing to develop a greater focus on value-based care, which involves clinical engagement to better understand the relationship between cost and patient outcomes. This is being a pilot, this, uh, there is a pilot for this in an Iron Bevan University Health Board and it's already showing significant pe potential in helping to redesign services, improve allocated uh, efficiency and to facilitate communication among different stakeholders within the hospital. We are investing in prevention and public health, although we know need, a lot more needs to be done in this area. The uh, Public Health Wales report, Making a Difference, Investing in Sustainable Health and Wellbeing for the People of Wales, was published in July this year. And it sets out the economic case for investment in preventative services, both within the NHS and without. Within the resources available, our members are working with partners in local government, housing and the third sector and industry to develop a new way of working that focuses on preventing ill health and keeping people out of hospital. And it was interesting to hear Trevor talk about um, the, the uptake of actual drug use, um, medication use um, and how low it was in certain cases, which actually really did surprise me. But greater support must be given to the NHS and other public services such as local government, social care, housing, education and leisure to invest in preventative services which will reduce demand on more expensive treatments in the future. So we're working to change the shape of the workforce. In order to move resources from secondary to primary care, we are developing new workforce models using prudent principles and based on multi multidisciplinary working in the community. For example, our 64 um, primary care clusters in Wales. Recently, we supported the Welsh Government's launch of the National Recruitment Campaign for GPs in Wales, which is part of a wider programme looking at the workforce challenges in primary care. For the longer term, we are producing a 10-year workforce plan for Wales, which will develop the services future skills and roles required, um, our education and our training needs, as well as sustainable recruitment and retention. However, we know that the long-term sustainability of health and care and services in Wales will depend on sustaining not just the NHS, but other systems and services in Wales, especially social care. This is evident as we start to feel the effects of winter pressures across the whole system. And while organisations have winter plans in place to help them cope through this period, they won't work if we fail to work with partners to support people stay well and seek the right treatment at the right place over the coming months and beyond. We would also like to see a long-term vision for the whole system, which includes greater investment in prevention and public health, 
shifting resources from acute sector into multidisciplinary primary and community services, investment in the health and care of workforce, and future applications of the prudent healthcare approach. And it was really pleasing to hear about the further work that the Bevan Commission was doing as well regarding the social model. As I emphasised earlier, the health service is not alone in the challenges it faces, and we are very aware of the difficulties our colleagues have across the rest of the sectors. But with this in mind, it is vital we all come together to share ideas, resources, knowledge and good practice in order to deliver the quality services to those who rely on them and to make sure we're doing all we can to create a healthier and happier fairer Wales. And one of the ways we're doing this is we have a conference in February, 1st of February next year, which involves a range of different players, including um, IABPI, who are very kindly are supporting one of our workshops under our Prudent Principles um, framework. So um, that is a very good example of actually enabling um, people to come together to share ideas and, um, and their knowledge and good practice in a way informally both networking but also learning at the same time. So, deal and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so, we have a panel session later, but I just put just Jane to pick up mm, on certainly. one or two things. I mean, maybe this is for Dr. Goodall rather than you, but you mentioned the need for more staff and so on. That seems to be everybody's creed occur. We need more nurses, more doctors. It seems to me when you train, you, you, you are fairly, fairly generalist, whether you're a nurse, doctor, or whatever. Then you get to be a specialist, and you don't do that anymore. Couldn't we sort of rethink how we use professionals in the health service more, more effectively? So they're multi-skilled instead of just little pockets of, of different Absolutely. skills. Isn't that cool? there, there, there is a lot of work going on in that area across both um, all the professions and, and equally with social services in terms of looking at ways that people can evolve their career. I know the RCN, for example, has got some thoughts about how to, to, to work with that as well. So there are ideas about how multidisciplinary teams, there's cross-learning cross opportunities and actually extending what people can actually do, both in starting, um, you know, whether they're professions or, or not professions, actually, yeah. in terms of healthcare. So there's quite a lot of work, and hence the, the workforce strategy that I mentioned that's really important. That, yeah, that's what tri yeah. triggered me yeah. to ask that, because yeah. certainly it seems to me that let's just take nursing, you know, there's so many little pockets of activity. You go into some wards in England, at least, I don't know about too much about some of the Welsh operations, and the nurses, well, I don't do this anymore. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. And so you've got... You, you know, if only they could just use the skills they had originally, mm. you would say you don't have to have more, you just have to yes. use that better. But I think the other part of actually, <laughs> beside training, is the, the whole aspect of people thinking differently about how they do their jobs. So yes. it's not just the training. And, and equally with the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, um, training again for, for medics, is, as example, needs to understand it's different here in Wales than it is in England in terms of how you actually support people. You mentioned that. Um, a shift in the way we resource this towards prevention would hopefully save money in the mm. in the long term. That's a big challenge, isn't it? Because people don't like to change lifestyles. No, people don't like to change lifestyles, but equally I think we have to help the public understand the need for change and how important it is for them and their own self-responsibility with their, their well-being. Yeah. And I think part of that too um, would be really thinking about how we could um, encourage more and more people to actually use different services to, for their health care, such as community pharmacy um, and self-medication, as opposed to actually having to go to um, a hospital or a GP. I noticed in the papers the other day that, um, uh, I think it was at least Boots were offering some sort of throat swab to see whether you've got a bacterium or a virus infection. Mm. If so, they were going to actually prescribe antibiotics in the pharmacy, mm. which is, uh, that's a bit of a change. Is that the sort of thinking that's going on in Wales? Well, I, I think there's a whole breadth of thinking going on in Wales, yeah. um, from pharmacy through social <coughs> care through to acute as well, in terms of how we can all work together and work differently. I think we've yeah. got to be prepared to, to actually think outside the box. And, well, and that's the disruptive thinking. Precisely, of, yeah, precisely yeah. Which, which you mentioned yeah. earlier. You know, And I think it's really important, instead of saying, <coughs> well, if we do what we've always done, we'll get what we've always got, yeah. it's like, we'll ask the question, what if we try it differently? Yeah. What if? Yeah. And even if it doesn't succeed, well, well, we can learn from it. Because I think all too often, good practice is all about things that went right, well, there's an awful lot of good practice about things that went wrong. Mm, yes. And learnings from those are just as important, if not more so, than actually the other side. Mm. I mean, that throat swab, I was a bit concerned whether it had been validated adequately to know whether it truly represents the, the proper diagnosis. It seems crazy to me that if you go in with a slight temperature, um, you're often given a broad-spectrum antibiotic, <laughs> and if it doesn't work, they change it. Mm. Um, 
and yet man walked on the moon and got back 40 years ago, and we can't even do a quick test to see if it's stat or stat or strep. So we need some technological change there as yes, well, I think, yes, that way. Yeah. But the idea of a different prescriber than just mm. the classical mm. uh, f physician or nurse pres yes. prescriber yes. is part of the future. I think, well, I think, I think there's, there's so many opportunities in the future, mm. but I think it's for everybody to, to think somewhat differently and be prepared to be different. Good.